Thank you very much for this very uh, inspiring talk. For me personally, I, I thought, first of all, uh, you have done a lot of work, <laughs> like more than 800 papers. So that's quite a lot of work. And the second impression was, um, so I think it's quite new, right? Nobody has done this. Well, that's, yeah, the idea is that, yeah, this is really driven by the claim that we're doing something, yeah, novel, yeah. There's a competition out there right now um, in this field that I'm contributing to, sustainability transitions. Um, they had a conference uh, about two months ago. All the biggest names were there in the phase out workshop. <laughs> There's a competition right now. People are writing papers on this now. Um, people have written papers on this, like in terms of, you know, case study X or case study Y. But no one has done like a really large scale literature review on this topic before. That's yeah, a, that's, that's why, an opportunity. That's why I felt this kind of new thing. Thank you very much for presenting about this today. So now I would like to uh, invite students from the classroom, students online. If you have any questions or comments, please uh, ask. Uh, by raising your hand and introducing yourself. And who would like to start? Sure. This is Rome. Yep. I'm a student at Insight. Um, so I, I'm just particularly interested about the subject that you talked about, like most of these things I'll uh, discuss about. And I was very impressed that there is no mention of like single use plastics or even talking about plastic in the field, right? Yeah. Yeah. Great, great. Yes. Um, yes. To tell, so I just everybody to, to recount this question. This was by a student um, who's um, a graduate student here in this uh, in this school, and he was asking about um, why didn't we find like more mention of plastics? And um, I was, to tell the truth, expecting to find more mention of this. I think in our data set, um, there's about maybe so some of the results I presented to you today, including the inventory that shopping list, that was actually based upon the older sample of 620 papers. We've since updated the sample um, and we updated the sample by removing search field limitations. Before we, um, we did not include any engineering and we did not include natural sciences, but now we've included everything, every field of science. And because of that, we have a small, small representation of plastics. There's about, I think, four papers <laughs> and they're new papers. Yeah, new papers. Um, so we're expecting to find more. I think, um, why isn't there more? I don't know. I think, um, Usually in publications, there's a, a time lag. Like for example, um, people like ourselves included, we're, we're tackling what is a can, currently a hot topic. We write a paper, it takes us a year. We put into peer review. We're going to submit this to one of the nature um, journals. It's probably going to take at least six months. In a year and a half, you're going to get this publication. So there's a time lag always, for example. Yeah. So it is discussed, but not to a large extent. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Thanks. Great question. Thank you. There's a question. Um, if I can take this, the one online by um, uh, Khan. Would you? Yeah. Would you like to um, please talk to us? Yep. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, for great presentation and interesting research. Uh, this is Haisam Khan. I am an alumni of uh, Kyoto University. I uh, graduated with an MBA and also got, got the opportunity to study at GSS. So I, my question is basically about your uh, slide related to the uh, the COP26 car, uh, uh, the conference. I read last week like uh, after the COP um, that f the phase out clause clause in the final draft it caused a lot of heated argument or you may say maybe drama when India and China actually uh, wanted it to change to phase down from phase out. And uh, if I'm not wrong in the later. Uh, it ended up in a, is an a, in an agreement uh, by changing the phase out into phase down, and now like I'm just curious to know about your thoughts about this type of approach to soften down um, 
um, the, the activities or the efforts uh, towards this thing like uh, how do you see it and realistically what does sound suitable for most of such emerging and developing nations to rely and switch their energy resources completely from rather cheaper and readily available fossil fuels towards emerging technologies such as renewable uh, where we have reliability related issues as well maybe and uh, uh, yeah that that's uh, i would like to hear your thought about it and once again thank you very much for great uh, research presentation uh thank you ken i'm very happy to hear that you're a graduate of um uh, kyoto university and thank you for joining us online yeah so um yeah thanks for paying attention to this so um to tell you the truth i mean yeah i was not um you know glued to every sort of minute of the negotiations regarding this clause um however um if i'm not mistaken this is um basically the if I'm not mistaken, this is the adopted um, text um, proposal. Okay, okay. Huh. I really See, hope that on, I this, have... on this last session on Saturday, sorry to interrupt, uh, they actually changed it to phase down. Really? Okay. Yeah, that... according to the, uh, maybe I can share the document with you. It's for, I read yeah. this in Financial Times. Financial Times. Okay, sure, yeah. sure. So I guess I, I apologize for not following this um, more thoroughly. I guess um, I was thinking that this made it to the final adoption and i was um because i was talking about this with my colleagues and nobody told me that this was changed the face down and I, and I did a quick internet search and i didn't find this either okay th that's really helpful thank you um yes face down that's interesting because basically in terms of meaning this means that we can still basically <laughs> maintain a, a share and um i think this basically shows you that you know like um yeah it just shows you how politically difficult it is to talk about phase outs. And I think um, when we talk about these at an international level, I think we have this big problem about the, um, what is it, common but, differentiate, but differentiated responsibilities. So especially the responsibilities of the um, advanced nations like, you know, um, America, Australia, Europe, um, you know, Japan, et cetera, we have a greater responsibility than other countries. However, Unfortunately, we're not phasing out these technologies. Um, America doesn't have a, a national phase out plan. Australia doesn't, Japan doesn't. And so why would we expect China and um, India to um, make efforts when actually these countries are already working very hard to reduce their dependence on fossil fuels? So um, yeah, this is, um, it's a little bit um, unfortunate because um, yes, this just shows um, how difficult it is for um, humanity to basically do the most obvious thing to fight climate change. <laughs> it's just like, if you can just have this vision in your mind of just a person on a treadmill in the gym, running along, sweating, but they're, they're basically eating, like drinking Coca-Cola and eating a hamburger while they're running. I mean, does this make sense? That's basically what we're doing right now. Thanks very much. And by the way, um, in Japan, we have a Japanese um, equivalent of phase out um, but for some reason, they call it in Japanese, uh, fade, uh, fade, out, fade out. And I don't really, fade out kind of sounds like kind of cool, right? Like, you know, it's, I yeah. just imagine like an like a ice skater or something, you know, that he's finished the performance and he just slides out of the arena. It's kind of cool, kind of dramatic. Um, I don't know why the policymakers talk about fade out in, Japan, in Japanese, but um, yeah, it just goes, I think it's just another classic thing. People just don't like this word, phase out, I think. <laughs> we change it. Yeah. Great question. And I'm embarrassed that I didn't that I wasn't aware that this was changed to fade down. And I'm very no, 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 no. Too. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the explanation. Thank and you. thank you, uh, uh, Professor Dimitris, as well, for arranging this thing. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for joining. Great. Yeah, there's a chat. Thank you. Ah, great, you've sent me the um, the document. Yep, so let's have a look at this, Khan. Um, so maybe I can share my screen. Um, uh, basically, this is uh, not the actual document, the minutes. Uh, I, yep. I just like randomly came through, across, I came across no, this that's, new- That's fine, yeah. Last week, yeah. Yeah, from financial. The last minute has changed. The last minute, yeah. Exactly, but last minute they changed, months, yeah, professor. I know Wow. Yeah, yeah, I'm really embarrassed that I didn't catch this, but I just, yeah, but whatever. Yeah, this is still interesting though, but yeah, disappointing. <laughs> Thank you very much. Are there any, any other questions, like either on Zoom or um, on the floor? Thank you. Hello. Yes. Oh. <laughs> 
um, finding each other and hopefully to decide students. So uh, my question is related uh, to the paper we had just read today. It was about tipping points. So maybe you heard this uh, like uh, term tipping yeah. point. Usually mm -hmm. it's used as a kind of like in a negative sense that uh, you know it's a nice uh, turn over some tipping points and uh, then you have like a longer time change and so on. But this paper was uh, writing uh, about tipping points in the sense that they uh, there, there are also tipping points for transitions to like more sustainable future. So uh, some um, uh, like if we reverse this concept of tipping points from negative to positive, <clears throat> uh, maybe we can find some particular um, policies that can actually accelerate uh, the transition to the sustainable future. And uh, they had two case studies. One was Norway, uh, electric vehicles in Norway. So uh, maybe you heard that in Norway, it's only like uh, more than 50% of vehicles are electric. New sales, yep. Yeah. And so the, uh, the paper claims that they could achieve it by uh, having like a cost parity between the cost of like electric vehicles and the petroleum. So naturally, uh, customers choose to buy electric vehicles because it's and cheaper to buy the petroleum ones. So, and, uh, so these are the authors of this paper. They claim that uh, achieving this kind of, uh, having these kind of subsidies towards EV kind of uh, created the tipping point. I heard that I'm in the it was, um, yeah, just a nice, interesting discussion about um, how he's read some papers recently, and they're talking about this concept of uh, tipping points. And tipping points is a concept that's usually used in natural sciences, especially climate change, that talks about, like, for example, if we think about Greenland that's, you know, rapidly melting because of climate change, there's going to eventually come a point where humans cannot stop this melting anymore. Basically, nature flips from one state to another because we've applied some sort of um, trigger, a, a stimuli. And that, that concept from natural systems is being applied to social systems now. So for example, when we're trying to transition society from point A to point B, um, can we achieve this so-called tipping point? And um, usually this is discussed in relation to, for example, the, competitive, the cost competitive, competitiveness of technologies. So I guess in Norway, you mentioned that uh, vehicles are selling extremely um, well over there. More than 50% of, of new car sales is battery electrics now that suggests that a tipping point has occurred, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And um, that's been created by the government like through subsidies in, in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So this is an artificially created tipping point, but I think um, there's never going to be a single driver for this. There's always gonna be multiple drivers and Norway, there's lots of um, really interesting um, reasons for this. A, they don't produce vehicles. So um, basically they're not gonna make anybody angry if they say we're only gonna import battery electric vehicles. Um, they're a very rich country like China. So they're able just to throw lots of money at these consumer subsidies, a small country. So they could basically put the, um, the charging infrastructure in a concentrated area. There's lots of advantages. Um, but um, if we're thinking about like Japan and like, you know, certain challenges we have with like um, coal-fired electricity, renewables, um, nuclear, you know, these challenges we're having phasing certain things out, what are the tipping points that are needed yeah, there are certain things that are missing in Japan, unfortunately, like we don't really have like the social pressure, like people, um, you know, demonstrating and saying, going up to the government and saying, you know, stop burning coal. It's a very, very small scale. So that's missing. Um, and so one of the um, important things in Japan, it seems to be is external pressure now. I've really noticed that um, um, Japanese companies and the government seems to be paying attention to um, international pressure. And I think one of the biggest um, reasons for the fact that Japan has doubled overnight its CO2 emissions reduction target for midterm for 2030. It's promised to reduce its um, CO2 emissions by 46% compared to 23%. And that occurred because Biden came into power. And within a month, I think Biden arranged a meeting with the um, Japanese government and said, hey, you guys have to work harder and increase your ambition. So <laughs> there's a thing there, but basically tr triggers um, occur um, because of cost usually. And this also cost is affected by scale. So in the beginning, um, you know, new technologies are very small scale, they're very expensive. 
and it's very difficult and pa painful. But then we have these big investments that are occurring. And right now with battery electric vehicles, we see that this is rapidly a snowball. We see that more and more companies are investing in this. We're getting more models on the market. People know about this. They're buying more of them. So in many countries, we are approaching a tipping point. And renewable energies has, has passed this in many countries. But Japan is yet to attain these for um, many of these key transition technologies. Um, yes. And there are many, many reasons for that, that I would put down to we can understand this through the social technical lens. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken, Russia is also, I think, probably very locked in to certain, um, you know, fossil fuel extraction, for example. Yeah, yeah. So there are, and don't worry, this is very normal. Countries like um, Australia, the same, we're locked into fossil fuel extraction. Mm. Great, thanks. And there was um, a question um, in the back of the room now, but I'm just checking Zoom. Uh, yeah, no more questions. So um, there's two students at the back of the room, please. Uh, yep. And uh, I think that I am a very uh, kind of Japanese and I hear about uh, very Japanese. Yeah. And this is a great. Yeah, well, well, welcome. Welcome. Please, yeah. You just say, please, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I, I have uh, two, two comments. Yeah. The first is like the Japanese people. I, my friends like driving and uh, he also likes to drive uh, his uh, gasoline engine car because he likes the sound of the car or uh, and also he likes the smile of the car. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the people use the kind of things. Yeah. And uh, what kind of things is uh, could be uh, made. Yeah. To sure. This kind of technology, the latest technology. Yeah. And uh, I feel like a very similar thing on uh, uh, euthanasia, like killing something. Ah, sure. Without, yeah. Uh, making damage. Euthanasia, eudacusi. Yeah, great. Yeah. Uh, how that works. Uh, uh, Unlucky. Sorry. Uh, Unlucky. Yeah. And uh, the second uh, comment, second. Uh, yeah, is that uh, why is that? Uh, so your paper is talking about how many is like uh, paper talking about data mm. and it's just not when you are uh, organizing the kind of paper. But the first paper, when the first paper is written, I think uh, someone or some idea of that this kind of technology is harmful or dangerous, this uh, idea was uh, already created by someone. Yes, yes. And uh, what is the uh, structure of the story behind the creation of this first paper? Ah, uh, yeah. How is this is yeah. uh, maybe a, a teacher supposed to be yeah. studied? Yeah. But I think the time the new innovation is come. Yeah. And uh, this kind of uh, harmfulness has uh, is created in, mm. the very, in the very beginning mm. of the creation of the, of the innovation, I, I feel. Yeah. Because like a light bulb or leaded gasoline, for instance, this was created. I think some people thought, oh, this is uh, very hot or to measure that kind of uh, mm. uh, criticism. So when and what what is structure for PayPal is uh, I'm interested. Ah, sure, sure. Your, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, Kazuki, thank you for your question. Um, I'm not sure if people online have are still there. Um, if if I was you, I probably would have logged off a long time ago because of the sound issues. But, um, so just quickly to summarize the question, there were two questions from a Japanese student, Kazuki. First of all, he was just commenting, there's not very many Japanese people here, but I'm very happy that there are three of you. Thank you. The first question um, was about um, gasoline vehicles and what are some potential approaches and policy approaches to you know, accelerating the phase out of this. And he was mentioning that some people like consumers, like the, the, the traditional gasoline engine because of the noise, the vibrations, 
the transmission, the manual changing gears. This is um, very normal in my generation. The second question um, was um, about the story about you know phase out. So I just showed you uh, papers today, but um, in the first first two papers I presented, one was on a coal fired power station, and the second one was like on this um, uh, pesticide phase out. This obviously is describing real world events several years after it's happened. So what's the story behind this? Let's begin with these, this question here. Um, unfortunately, this case study part is, um, is it's coming. <laughs> so um, I can't really answer this, but um, I can just tell you about what I've read from these two papers. Yeah, it's just basically saying that in the US, it's basically um, responding to uh, pressure, um, public pressure. And um, it's very, um, not talking about climate change, it's talking about local air pollution. And um, so uh, the idea was that they would switch to other uh, fossil fuels, there would be less polluting. That, they're switching to oil, actually, burning oil. We don't do that anymore because burning oil is too expensive. It's a waste. But that was the approach. And, um, and then in the pesticides, it was environmental issues. However, there was another um, reason um, cited, which was basically um, resistance. Many pesticides, actually, um, if you use them over and over again, weeds and bugs develop a resistance, like um, antibiotics. And um, this is, so it's basically a performance problem. They become less effective. So this was another reason for um, one of the, um, this phase out of, of this organochlorine pesticides that were cited. So there were different reasons, yeah. So um, as I said before, in the beginning of my lecture, we have kind of read the abstracts of 125 papers and we're embarrassed to say we don't really know anything about any of these topics. <laughs> That's kind of the next step. The idea is that we're gonna use this as a, a basis for then doing um, detailed policies. So we're gonna, we're gonna replace papers in the next study with policies. And we're gonna basically create a, a, a stratified sample using the results from this paper, because now we know the distribution like of discussions of you know, substances versus technology and countries. We'll look for actual real world policies that fit in with this strata. And then we will um, build up our empirical knowledge. So this is something for the future. And I've only studied phase outs of coal and a little bit about gasoline vehicles. So I can address the second question. And yeah, the, the common approach actually is um, used by California, who was, who, um, and China has imported the approach from California. California has two policy instruments. The first one is one that's very common and used around the world. It's basically um, environmental standard. It basically says to the manufacturers that make cars, you are only allowed to emit this much CO2 with this engine. And it's usually by you know 100 miles, 100 kilometers. It's a certain number of grams of CO2. And what they do is they raise that every few years, few years. And so they raise it so high that it becomes impossible to meet this target with an internal combustion engine. That's the first approach. The second approach is it's, it's much more strict. They say every year you have to produce a certain percentage of zero emission vehicles. That can be a battery electric vehicle or it can be a fuel cell vehicle, but it has to be zero emission. And you have to produce a minimum percentage. And this is called the um, a ZEV mandate. It's become really famous around the world. Um, and it seems to be the only way of forcing industry to make these changes. So industry, industry gets angry, of course. So then you give them rewards. You say, if you produce more than this, and you, for example, if we say you have to produce 6% of your vehicles as battery electric this year, if you produce 8%, you can sell those extra 2% as a credit to another company. And actually some companies that are not producing enough, amazingly Toyota buys these credits. <laughs> and um, Tesla who produces 100% electric vehicles is making a lot of money, A, by selling vehicles, B, by selling credits. So um, this is um, a, it's, it's a, a, it mirrors the approach of a cap and trade we use this approach for power stations. We say you can emit a maximum of this much CO2. That, um, that limit lowers every year, eventually get to zero. And then um, if you reduce more than that, you can sell your excess efforts to another company. It's a standard approach in environmental uh, policy and, e and economics too. So that's the approach. And China has imported this approach too. Um, who else is doing this approach? The EU is looking at this. The EU is using currently CO2 emission um, targets. Japan doesn't have this approach because Japan relies on, as I said before, voluntary, <laughs> as you know, industry roadmaps. So I think probably Toyota and Honda will probably um, 
yeah, Honda has already voluntarily, very kind of them, they've said we're going to stop producing gasoline vehicles in 2030. So problem solved. This is the Japanese style. Mm. Toyota hasn't done that yet. Toyota, um, because they count hybrid. Yeah, so there's a big battle between Toyota and the Japanese government about should hybrid vehicles be permitted as a zero emission vehicle? Um, clearly, it's not zero emission, is it? Because um, people can drive on the gasoline. And when you drive on gasoline, the efficiency is very poor. And even if you have a plug-in hybrid, if you drive beyond the range of the battery, many people, it's gasoline is kind of cheap now. People just don't care and they pay the money and they, and they burn the fossil fuel. So this is creating problems all around the world too. So they're controversial actually. Great questions, thank you. Maybe it's not I don't know, thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much. Um, no, first one is just a comment. Yeah. From your presentation, and it's kind of it seems like phase outs are environmentally and health driven, but obviously yeah. and economically influenced at the end of the day, after listening to everything that you said. Right, right, yeah, yeah. Um, so just looking at the original papers of the one who asked this question for why we switch, um, the, we talk about phase out policies, and usually focuses on what the good things about phase out policies. Yeah. Question that I want to pose is yeah. What, what's the bad thing? Sure. About? Yeah. And do you see? You mentioned coal. If you mm. have a coal factory, you have a coal mine. Mm. You have people. You mentioned jobs, economic impacts of it. Mm. Mm. But what about the plan making the policy about like how to make sure that the mm. impact or the footprint left behind mm. by that industry? I mean, is it taken into account in those policies? Mm. Yeah. This is something that we always consider. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. So um, that's a great question. So basically, for people online, if you're still there, um, thank you. <laughs> um, there's a question about the negative impacts that are provoked by phase out. So for example, the easy one to understand is um, unemployment. If the government commits to, um, you know, phasing out coal fired power stations, if that coal is coming from domestic coal mines, that means that the coal mines will have to close down because they'll lose their customer. And so what happens to the unemployment that's created? So yes, this is an extremely important concept, and this is captured by the concept of just transition. So when people talk about like, you know, the energy transition, which people like I do use this word a lot, other people that care about these people that, you know, you know, for example, people that work in coal mines, for some people, they're the enemy. But at the end of the day, they're human beings. They're our fellow human beings. They're just trying to make a living. And some of these people were doing this before we spoke about climate change. And some of these people, there are different reasons why they work in coal mines. So we should still protect them. So um, we have to make sure that um, people that are going to lose their jobs, including com entire companies, should be supported. And um, so this concept is discussed a lot, ju just transitions. And But what I find, I've never really focused on this a lot in my research, but I find that most of the time, people focus on this in the perspective of fossil fuel extraction. But what I find in a country like Japan that doesn't have fossil fuels, if we... If we um, phase out technologies, for example, nuclear, or if we phase out um, coal-fired power plants, the companies that make these plants, the companies that operate them, the communities that support these industries are going to decline. And we're going to have the same problem of unemployment just triggered in a different area of the economy. So um, this is um, a big problem. It's a big problem, yes. And so um, the idea is we need measure, that's why phase outs are good, because we set, it's a long term <laughs> approach to you keep repeat, repeating this. In many countries like Germany, they give compensation packages, they give like billions of dollars to these mines and say retrain your workers, hopefully in a green job, like we don't want someone to go from coal extraction to oil <laughs> extraction. Hopefully they'll go and build wind turbines, for example. But um, the idea is to retrain them to give people, you know, these handsome payouts. But yeah, I mean, Imagine, I don't know, like imagine if you were somebody said to you that you can't study your PhD at Kyoto University anymore. We're going to give you 50,000 US dollars, but goodbye, don't come back tomorrow. Uh, I don't think you'd be happy. You'd be, you could, you could live, but you've probably lost a part of your identity, your, of your life, your soul, you know, so phase outs are, it's messy stuff. It's messy stuff. So um, I don't have much experience in understanding this, but I just know that um, in Japan, my interviews with, um, the companies that make coal-fired power stations, they made it very clear 
and of other interviews as well that yeah there's um they're trying to also protect their factory workers and sudden phase outs sudden policy changes by government has a big impact on industry and so it's yeah academics we say that you know we should phase out a and b but in reality it's very difficult um yes so um there are negative parts of phase out we have to assume that every time the government makes a policy that causes a very abrupt, abrupt transition or change in you know, society that we create new problems. And the final comment I'll make actually is um, the transition to already um, uh, renewable energy and battery electric vehicles is already starting to make pro other problems. It's happening, for example, with the extraction of raw resources, right? Lithium, cobalt for batteries, um, and also, um, wind turbines, solar panels, they all require these new metals that are in limited supply. And a lot of them are produced overseas. They're, you know, they're refined in conditions we don't really know about. So we're creating new problems every time we um, try and solve something. This message got the world very angry. Did you all hear about the movie? Um, I, I don't recommend you watch it. Please don't watch it. But uh, Michael Moore, the American director, um, Planet of the Humans, okay. Yeah, I think that that message, that message, I think is kind of, it's, it's half true, I think. And people kind of dismiss the entire film. But I think that that message, unfortunately, was misunderstood because he was very, I think, I don't agree with the way he framed other issues. Like he, he made out like people drive battery electric vehicles driven by coal-fired power, which is not the case for most of the world. But anyway, I'll stop talking. Great question. Okay. Sorry, but um, time is up. Sure. We are already, we are supposed to finish like 7.45. So almost eight o'clock. So if you have any further questions, could you please uh, contact directly Professor Fletcher after this uh, workshop? So uh, with this, first, uh, let me once again thank you with uh, some applause. Yeah. <laughs> Great presentation sure. and interesting discussion. And, uh, I hope that uh, we can continue this discussion also in the future, in future events or, uh, or like personal communication. And in the end, uh, let me thank all of you, all students who joined in the classroom and also online for your active participation. And uh, I also hope to see you all. Thank you again and have a good evening.